How's your day going? It's uh, going pretty well, I would say. Yeah, you know, I have been weird. You know what? If we're going to sort of jump right in, um, I ran that half. Oh, I ran the Brooklyn half marathon on Saturday. Yeah. And uh, it went pretty well. It was definitely a little warmer than I would have liked, but whatever. But since then, I've been like weirdly kind of out of it. Like it really took a lot out of me. And I think because I'm not getting enough sleep with my kids, it just sort of haven't recovered yet. I'm, or maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know. <laughs> well, it was... Ha- Do you guys ever get that? Do you guys ever get like multiple days oh, of weird like fatigue yeah. after a long run? Absolutely. After a long run. I get okay, that. So it's not I get me, that after right? like a single workout. <laughs> like why is it Thursday and I still feel like shit? Yeah. How, how much did the heat affect you? I know it got super hot later in the day. How bad was it at the time of the race? Right. Yeah, from you know, from, it wasn't that bad actually, because uh, it was super foggy. So um, even though I guess it was kind of humid, I found it to be pretty nice overall. Um, but I know that for people who finished later, because they were either in the second wave uh, and, and they maybe ran a little slower, uh, I know it got pretty brutal out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were clipping along there at like six something pace. I mean, better than I could have done. <laughs> How? So- I was looking at your Strava. Do you really only run like once a week or do you only upload to Strava like once a week? No, if, if, it, if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen. So I, yeah, I really, I wish I ran more consistently, but it's usually once a week, sometimes twice, sometimes none. It's pretty inconsistent. Okay. You've got some distance chops for only. I was going to say, yeah, you're able to still pull, pull out a solid time considering that you're only running that often. It looks like when you do run though, you do run pretty long. At least you're, right. you're getting in a good lengthy run, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, my, yeah, my runs for me are usually at least the very, very least six or seven miles, usually around nine or 10, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. And Chris, you're the one who, you're the guy who won the mile. Correct. <laughs> yes. Correct. Yeah. So you were, <laughs> right. you were hyping me up on that yeah. home stretch, uh, which was, <laughs> which was hilarious. How, how did you even get involved in, the, that NYC qualifier tracked me. Like, who reached out to you? How did you hear about that? It's a good question. So, about six months ago, it it sort of dawned on me that for someone who enjoys running uh, as much as I do, and who's signing up for and and you know racing in these uh, events um, pretty frequently, who also happens to be you know, famous and have a, a, a pretty big platform, I feel like there's more I, sh- I could be doing with my running. Um, and I feel like there's probably opportunities out there for, for someone in my position who's passionate about running and doing it anyway to get more involved both with organizations, events, and hopefully potentially some sponsors. So I, uh, through my friend, um, Alexi. Papas. She gave me her uh, manager, um, Liam, who I started working with, who's who's doing a great job just sort of putting me out there, getting me on uh, podcasts and, and in sort of the running community, and also, you know, getting me invited to events like the uh, Trials of Miles. So, that, so, so he said to me, hey, there's a track meet coming up. Any interest? And I said, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. And of course, he told me, oh, okay, there's like a fun celebrity exhibition mile. So I show up thinking like I might actually win this thing. I'm actually pretty fast. But obviously not <laughs> because you guys are all like legit runners. And I'm just like this grubby TV, washed up TV show. Host. <laughs> anyway. Well, you can't expect to win the race when you're like stopping on the home stretch to like pump up the crowd and like <laughs> yell at yell at the other runners to <laughs> to run faster. I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, I, by, the, by my third lap, I realized I was 100 percent coming in last. Um, and I figured I, I, I might as well get the photo op. So you were coming around for your fourth lap. I sort of jogged in place for a, for a few seconds until you got close. And then, uh, just as I had planned, um, made it look as though I was winning. Uh, although my, my wife who was in the, in the stands said that there were a few, uh, I think sort of offended like track moms who thought that perhaps my 
display was like somewhat unsportsmanlike uh, in some way. I feel like we need you know, to. I guess, yeah, we, those those parents and we gotta unpack that because the the official also like. It's a dude. It's a fucking influencer well, mile. That guy was out of. His he life. was. We thought the same thing. Like we knew we were there for fun. He was screaming. Yeah. 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 I. I, I didn't get that at all. Like I, I can get for one of the other races where people are whatever, they're going for a time that's going to get them into the trials. Oh, yeah. But like the whole point of the, you know, celebrity mile, exhibition mile, whatever you want to call it is literally to entertain the audience and get them to like get hyped up. Yeah. So like, I didn't get why he, he was giving you shit before we even started the race. Uh, he was like, like telling you to get back on the line and quit like raising your hands and stuff. It's like, what? <laughs> well, I didn't have a number and I didn't even know I was supposed to have a number. And he was, you know, it was a mess. I was a mess. I, I was definitely like, a, I stuck out. I was, I was definitely, you know, not, it was definitely my first, like, but also my, my wife, also my wife grew up running track, like very seriously in high school in Michigan. So like for her, it was so exciting to be at a track event. She hadn't been at one, obviously probably since high school. And she even said to me afterwards, she was like, Neve, you know, like, I got to say, I don't think that was cool. Like, you know, you got to, you take, run your race, man. Finish strong. Don't, don't, don't take it so, so lightly. And I was like, that's the point. It was supposed to be yeah. fun. Anyway, I had a good time. And I, I was so happy when I saw the picture of you smiling. Exactly. Exactly. I was going to say, I wasn't offended. So like anyone who's saying that right. you were offending people, it's like, just look at the picture. I was slapping my ass off. Right. I was just so confused because right. I came around the curve to the home stretch and like, you're looking at me and I'm just like, why is the Catfish TV host like staring me down? Like I had no, I was just out of it because I was like out of breath and tired. And I was like, what is he doing? <laughs> Oh, it was great. How, 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 what'd you, end, what'd you end up running? Uh, I think I ran 436. Yeah, that sounds Is right. That, yeah, yeah, 436. Wow. So I ended up doing what, the beer mile, the beer mile. mile later in the night too, which was another, like similar type of thing. It was meant to be like an entertainment uh, right. piece of it as well. But the official was getting a little pissed before that too, because we were like joking around and stuff and he was getting all serious. Like, come on, man. Like this is. Wait, so you, you guys, you guys organized your own like event. Yeah. So with, uh, athletic, have you heard of athletic brewing? Like they make the NA beer. Um, they make non-alcoholic beer. They, they had with right at the uh, end of the meet or I guess one event from the before, end, they yeah, did the 5K a, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. They did a beer mile just again, like to like a halftime show kind of thing before the final races. Right. And, um, so myself and then the world record holder in the beer mile and a couple other people, uh, had a, had a beer mile race to entertain the crowd. And what, what, yeah, what I'm sure your listeners will know, and I, I'm embarrassed to ask, but what technically qualifies a beer mile? What, what's required to officially run a beer? Yeah. Mile? So it's, uh, it's four beers and four laps. So yeah. beer, it's beer, beer, to, beer to start and then lap beer lap. Beer lap. lap beer. Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. And, and usually, so the official rules wow. are like, it has to be above a 5% ABV beer and it can be either a can or a bottle. But, sure. uh, but for that one, it was because athletic was sponsoring it. We did athletic brewing beers and, uh, yeah, so, but the same thing, oh the official, God. the official is all, all on He's our like asses getting too. He's like, like rowdy about the, the <laughs> staging area for the beers. And it's like, dude, this is like part of the, oh my <laughs> it's God. a build event. Like we knew about this. <laughs> yeah. I, I ran, I ran a, uh, uh, what do they call it? I, I can't remember. There's a, there's a race in Manhattan in the Lower East Side around uh, one of the parks. Um, I think it's Tompkins Square Park. That's like a pizza, three, like a 5K ah. or, something, or not a 5K. It's like three or four laps around the park. And each time you do a lap, you got to eat a slice of pizza. It's kind of like, that sounds like know, fun. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> that actually sounds kind of worse than beer. I don't know. Yeah. Right, so, so a beer mile, would you consider doing it? Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm not a big beer drinker. Uh, in fact, I usually don't drink beer because it, I find that it makes me very like gassy, you know, like, and, uh, and so, um, I would probably do terribly. Uh, I would plan on losing and finding a way to, to make fun of, of myself, but I would absolutely do it. So whenever you guys organize your next run, I wish I had known you were doing it. Uh, that night, I might have stuck around. Well, yeah, you're you're absolutely on the list for the next one. Um, but I guess for for good reason, you had to leave. I mean, you were running a half marathon like you know twelve hours after that, so totally understandable yeah. to get out of there. <laughs> so was that the intent too? With or were you trying to run the mile hard that night, or were you just like, no, I got the half marathon in the morning. I'm just here to mess around. Yeah, no, I mean, I I know my limits um, pretty well now at this point, uh, and. The, the last time I ran 
uh, sort of exhibition mile was in 2017 or 2016, whatever. Uh, when uh, New York Roadrunners organizes their annual Fifth Avenue yeah. mile down yep. Fifth Avenue. And um, I had been training pretty seriously to run the marathon that fall and was in great shape. I had actually run a 5K that morning um, and, and had, I think, set my own sort of personal best at five, in a 5K and then walked over to the, run this Fifth Avenue mile and um, like two or three strides in, I felt this insane oh God. <laughs> like bolt of lightning that just sort of jolted through my whole body yeah. and st- starting in my back. And I didn't know what to do. I, I almost stopped, but I, but I was so concerned with like how weird and embarrassing that would look if I only made it two strides ran, in like, or so. a, like a half of, so like, I'm just going to power through. And then somehow I guess my adrenaline like kicked in and took over and I ended up finishing the mile. And I ran pretty quick. I ran like a five twenty four or something, which for me, I, you know, After I never doubling back from a five K that's mile. pretty damn good. <laughs> a- anyway, I, it turns out I had a terribly herniated Ooh. disc that had basically completely, you know, displaced itself some, at some point in the 5k and then was only sort of compounded in that mile. And, um, and so I was out. I mean, I, I, I didn't so you, run for like you three months. I, didn't, on that? I couldn't run a marathon that year. I didn't, I had a few injections okay. to help okay. sort of like mellow it out. Um, but I ended up then sort of learning that if I'm going to run, I have to sort of take better care of myself and be a little bit more conscious about all that stuff. So it was kind of a good lesson. And then the following year, I, I, I also learned that like, I don't know how to best describe it. Basically. Um, well, I just saw Top Gun, the new Top Gun, which comes out any day now. And there's a great scene where Tom Cruise is pushing. Uh, he's got a, he's part of this test testing uh, program for this plane. They've got to try and get it to go Mach 10. And of course, he gets it to go a little faster than that. And then of course it falls apart and explodes. Right. My body is kind of like that airplane. Can't go that fast, but like, I know the speed, I know the speed at which my body starts to like rattle and potentially come undone. And honestly, it's anything, anything sub six. Like if I try to run any under six minute miles, like I just can't, my body's just not designed for that. Yeah. You know, I feel that. (laughs) So I've sort of stopped trying to do that. (laughs) Um, and that's why for the mile the other night, I was just like, well, I'm just going to go comfortably. And, and, you know, if I can get it, if I can go under sub six, great. But like, I also don't want to kill myself and get injured. Fair so enough. I, 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 I yeah. pulled back. So, I mean, you're a 258 marathoner. So like you have run fast in the marathon. Like, do you have a goal of trying to run faster than that in the future? Or like, where, what are your running goals now at this point? Yeah, it's tough because like that was a major goal that I had set when I first decided I was going to start running. Um, that was sort of my motivation. I was, I, I, my dad had been a runner. He ran um, the New York City Marathon once in I think like 1986 or something. And he did it in just under three hours. Um, and growing up, he lived still one block from the finish line of, of the marathon. Awesome. So every year he would take me to the finish line when it was obviously like very mellow and you could just walk up to the stands and get a seat. Um, and we would watch the, the, the winners come across and it was always this, you know, cool annual tradition. And he's like a very, he's like one of those guys, he's very huge sports fanatic and very into sort of sports as a metaphor for everything. So growing up, you know, running was always this thing that he would talk about and use as an example of, you know, athleticism and, and clearing your head and meditation and all these. Anyway. So, so I just decided, all right, cool. Let me try it. I, I can run a I can run a sub three. Um, and I realized very quickly how hard that was. Uh, and it took me three tries. Um, and obviously a lot more training than I had initially anticipated to get there. And then once I got there, I was like, okay, cool. I did it. Great. Now, now what? Like, I, do I set another goal or, 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 do I try to run another marathon under three hours, like maybe Boston, but it is a little weird. Cause like, I do want to have a goal to like, right. work towards. And so I could, I could just keep trying to, you know, run faster, but like two fifty, 
I I don't know. I just like I'm not what sure the what, next barrier I'm not is. Sure what I, yeah, yeah. Right. Huh. That's yeah. That's it's a good point. I guess because I also know that I in order to in order to run that even those three or five or six minutes faster like would require again that much more training at, and a little bit faster. I'm like, do am I am I going it like really am i gonna put myself through all that for a few more minutes like is it worth it you know? oh the, the debate like... the debate of every every runner that's you Literally. know post past their like right. i mean obviously college post running college, or yeah. professional running is different but everyone else who's doing it just for the love of running is like questioning that same thing like, like is God it really worth it I... anymore or should i do other things yeah in life? am i re- am i really waking up at six before work oh, every to... single day right. well also i've got yeah and i've got three young kids right now yeah. so it's like to, to to negotiate, you know, an hour and a half or two hours, you know, more than more than once a week in the morning, which leaves my wife with the kids to deal with school and cool, but it's like it's a lot, right? So, I think the dream, the, honestly, the the dream, if if I could uh, sort of do anything, um, would be to get a sponsorship to send me to. Colorado or Oregon or Africa to like train for real mm. for 12 weeks at like a full on facility with all the cross training and the PT and like, and like, and then I could really push and see just how fast I could go. Um, but I think anything short of that, I'm probably just going to end up doing what I'm doing, which is, you know, enjoying running, signing up for races and, and, you know, always sort of, playing with the idea of running a something like this, this coming fall, um, my friend Casey Neistat, who probably you guys probably know, um, he's a, he's a runner too. He wants, he's never run a sub three and, and he's come really, really close. And so we've, we've been texting and sort of joking like, okay, this is the year Casey, like if you're going to do it, I'll do it. Like, let's, let's do it. So, you know, I might start training again this summer for that. Um, because it would be nice to, to do, a little faster. And I think I could have done a little faster that year, but, um, my, my coach and, and my pacer, Roberto, uh, who's amazing. Who's the head, head coach for New York Roadrunners. He, he left me, he like, he bailed on me at like mile 22. Um, because what I didn't know at the time, though he said he was just going to the bathroom was that he had been running with like a sprained toe oh, or something God. and it was killing him. And he could just, could, he just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. So he told me like, I'm, I'm going to use the toilet. I'll be right there. <laughs> just keep going. And I uh, somehow managed to pull it off, you know, on my own, which kind of was satisfying, but I, I know if he had been there cracking the whip, I probably could have shaved off a couple more. He minutes. left. Yeah. Probably one of the harder parts of a yeah, marathon. When, when you I need know, it the right, most. Right at like, yeah. yeah. A hundred and like 14th and fifth Avenue. Back, back to your uh, point though. I think there's something there with uh, like, what does it look like for somebody who is an average runner to go to, um, like something that comes to mind is like where the U S Olympic team trains in, in Colorado Springs. Like, what does it look like if a normal person went there and got that type of attention? Yeah. See, see what the improvement right. is. Well, that's, I know. Well, that's, well, I think part of what it kind of ex- inspired me was, um, two, I guess two years ago now I was on dancing with the stars mm-hmm. and I've always loved dancing. I dance very casually as a, as like a elementary middle schooler, um, but to get to spend 12 weeks working with a professional dancer and choreographer three or four hours a day, yeah, it's amazing how good you can get at something. Yeah. And I just feel like I, I'm, I'm sure if I had that much time and that in the right facilities, like I could be so much better, but like, when am I going to do also, that? You know what I mean? There's also and, so and many would, people right. that have like i i think naturally you have like quite a bit of talent just based on on your runs I, and right. there's, I think there's that, so yeah. many people who have that but like obviously see the gap between you and what a, what a pro runs and it's like honestly like right there is a difference but i think the difference is a lot smaller than people think yeah you're saying the talent difference is if everyone if all if everyone were able to train the exact same for the exact same number of years right, the right, talent right, difference right. is small yeah right yeah, that's. I'm curious on the with yeah. like bringing it up dancing with the stars and then how this would relate to running. Like, did you find that over the course of you know putting in all of that time practicing, that you loved it more as time went because you got better at it, or did you find that you got like kind of sick of it because you were dedicating so much time to it? Um, no, I I definitely found that 
as you get better at something, generally you enjoy it more. You know, it, it becomes more fun, more exciting. You start surprising yourself with, with things that you're able to do that I previously either hadn't been able to or thought I wasn't able to. Um, and obviously there's like a competition factor, which is fun. You know, the further you kind of get in the show, the, the closer you get to winning. Um, and, and that's obviously something that, isn't really a part of my running. Although coming in, I think I came in like 760th in the half marathon, which is pretty awesome. Like when I think about it, for you know, how I mean, many people that run it, like... it's not, it's, it's not podium worthy, but it's still like pretty cool. And I'm like, I, I guess I could, I could go faster and probably come in like 300th. And then, you know, like, yeah. I'm sure I would get more competitive the faster I got. Um, but that would also be fun. So anyway, I, you know, it's, it's cool. It's cool. And, and I, I think I'm, I'm working with Liam and, and potentially a sponsor might be listening to this right That's now. Right. I want to take a bunch of, I want to take a bunch of average people who love running, but have never had a chance to like really see how good they are and, and take them all to some place and like maybe make a show or, or something about like, yeah. you know, pushing the limits of, of, of average the sponsor of this podcast episode is manscaped <laughs> and you know neve you got a, a beautiful beard um you know you wait hold on let me <laughs> wait, wait, let, let me get my i have my uh my lawnmower no, right no way <laughs> oh manscaped is gonna eat this up <laughs> yeah beautiful look at that <laughs> there you go look at that Wait, look, I just, I actually just recently trimmed. Look how nice and trimmed that. I don't trim here. I just, just here. Oh, well, I've been, I've been waiting for it to call me for years. That is kind of, that is funny that they haven't I, hit I'm you up. the hair guy on TV. What's their, yeah, yeah, you got to be the face of That's Manscaped what I was, at this point. I was just thinking that it's like so fitting that, that this episode that Man, Manscaped's been sponsoring, sponsoring our show for a while now. And it's like. You know, you are the, you could be the face of Manscaped uh, to Easily. the world. Easily. <laughs> or the chest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so when did, I guess, when did you actually start running? Like all this time that you're filming the, the Catfish TV show and everything and you're traveling a lot, yeah. filming, you know, on site. Like, were you going out for runs during that time or is this something you picked up just in the last few years? So, yeah, so I, I didn't run at all um, pretty much ever. I mean, you know, in, in I guess middle school, high school, like they have to run, you know, a yeah, mile PE test or PE or class. Yeah. And, yeah, and I and I went to a sports camp growing up in Maine and, like, played sports. and But, you know, I was never an actual tr- sort of track kid um, or track and field. So it wasn't until I think it was – 2000 it must have been 2014 maybe or 2015 so i was 30 31 and um i was speaking of casey neistat i was visiting casey up in connecticut and at that time he was really into triathlon uh and he had done the iron man but it turns out in his town new london in connecticut where he where he had a house they had like that weekend they had a little sprint a triathlon sprint um, which I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but it's like, you know, a quarter mile swim or yeah, something. Yep. And then a 17 mile bike ride and then a 5k, yep, something like yep. that. Anyway. So like I got up there on a Friday afternoon and it was Saturday morning was this event. And he said, Neve, you should do it with me. And I was like a triathlon. <laughs> I, like, I don't, I, I don't do it. Like I, I ride my bike a lot, but I'm not, I'm not in shape for that. He's like, don't worry. It's so short. You'll be fine. Like you'll do it. Yep. So he signed me up. He borrowed his one neighbor's bicycle and the other's neighbor's running sneakers. I didn't have anything. I, I mean, I, I, I hadn't come up to, to race, you know? Um, but luckily the guys had two sizes were close enough. And, um, and I, and of course I'm the only joker just like in a pair of like board shorts, everyone else is, you know, in like there, it's like fucking new London. It was freezing. The water, you know, I mean, like, anyway, I, 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 so I, I got, I competed in that race. I remember the swim was so hard. What was your um, swimming experience I, I, before? Again, n- <laughs> Cause I would, I, I would argue just, that I, I, like going from zero to a triathlon sprint swim is way harder than zero to a, a 5k. 
Oh no, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But I hadn't done anything. <laughs> so, so I, I, so I get out there, I've, obviously I'm hyped up, I'm excited. And I start, you know, doing a crawl for the first 10 seconds and I'm like completely winded and totally out of breath. So I end up just doing like the backstroke for, I think it was honestly, it took me, I think like 35 or 40 minutes. It was so I had a very hard. similar experience. <laughs> but, but, but I got out of the water and I jumped on the bike and that, and, and I fortunately was in shape enough to then kind of catch my breath and uh, made up some time on the bike and then ran a pretty solid 5k. And I remember after that being like, whoa, this is fun. Like group races are awesome. Like I want to do this more. And that was actually when I was like, you know what, I'm going to run the marathon um, and see, you know, see how it goes. So that was like the very specific moment when uh, I realized that competitive or, or even just sort of adult racing events yeah. <laughs> were pretty yeah, fun. That, I, it, it seems like running is like one of those things that's like very polarizing in a way where everyone who doesn't run is like, God, running is so stupid. Like, why would you ever want to go out for a run, et cetera. But then like, once right. you like get the bug, it's very easy to get hooked and be part of the community and, and just love, I don't know. Once you like find it for well, your inner and motivation and for yourself, it, it usually converts people to becoming lifelong, you know, runners or wanting to pursue it. Also, like, I think, and this is again, sort of what you, what you had pointed out earlier, like, I, you know, uh, there aren't that many things that I'm good at. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I'm okay at a few things and I have some hobbies that I like, but like, I don't excel in, in any number of, of things, certainly not physical things. Um, I'm competitive and I like sports and like, you know, get me on a go track race <laughs> yeah. and I'll, and I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. But like when I started running and I, and I realized like I was actually pretty naturally sort of gifted to have the physique and whatever, long capacity that you need that was exciting to discover something that like I actually liked and was pretty good at. Um, and so to be able to run a, to, to train, you know, it was really hard, but to, to, to run a sub three and, and feel that accomplishment and that satisfaction, like, wow, I did something really hard that not a lot of people have done. Like that was awesome and exciting. Um, and so to answer your other question, like, so what was really fun about it was that I had been traveling and making catfish and, and going all over the country. And now I had this thing that mm -hmm. I could do every time I went somewhere new to like see a town yeah. or explore a city. Um, and that's really what's been, I think a big factor in kind of keeping me motivated is because, you know, I do travel and, you know, there's a lot of mornings that start later for us because, um, we fly in and the crew has to set up and, and they're, they're not allowed to start filming the next day within a certain number of hours of when they finish. So, you know, we may not start till 11 or 12 o'clock the yeah. next day. So I've got these long mornings and, you know, there's nothing to necessarily do in these smaller towns. So I'm like, Oh great. I'll go for a run. And, and Oh, there's a river a few miles away. I'll like find a, 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 a trail along the river or there are actually a lot of amazing trails and like rails to mm -hmm. trails and, and park like trip paths that you'd be shocked exist and that are generally completely, uh, uninhabited and, and underutilized. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, when I go for runs in most places. I don't see other runners. It's, it's, it's sad, but it's true. Yeah. It's also kind of cool. You feel like you stumbled upon yeah. like a little treasure. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That just happened to me last, uh, two weekends ago. I was in, um, New Jersey, just South of Trenton, which is the capital. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, saw that there was a river it, you know it's always a sort of a crapshoot like when you see a, a, a trail you don't know what that's going to be <laughs> how long it's going to go um, yeah. yeah but right if it's gonna uh, right it looked like there maybe was a bridge over like you know you just don't know um but it turns out it was honestly one of the most beautiful if not the most beautiful nature trail i've ever seen it was perfect hard packed like small gravel really wide, unbelievably clean and manicured, not a piece of trash. And it ran like on this weird sort of, uh, sliver of land banked by like a stream and a river, um, for six or seven miles. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, it was just so nice. Um, I went way, I ended up running 14 miles just cause I didn't want to stop. It was just so yeah. nice. Um, so that was cool. That What's was it like going into <laughs> shooting after doing a run like that? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, usually at first it's fine. 
I definitely like crash in the mm-hmm. afternoons, right? So like I'll try I'll, if I can squeeze a nap in sometimes, like while we're waiting outside of a location and they're setting up, I'll I'll grab a quick like ten or fifteen minute nap. Um, and then you know sometimes I'm a little a little zonked, like yeah. we said you know uh, earlier. Um, but generally, again, because when I'm on the road, it's also really nice because as much as I love being home with my wife and children, I don't get a ton of sleep. So. I, I, being able to then just like get in bed and go to and stay in bed until seven or eight the next morning is a, is a, is a great sort of way to recover from a longer run. So, yeah. um, seven or eight is late for me. I'm usually out of bed by five with the yeah, kids. So, absolutely. um, yeah, I mean, so you, yeah. you mentioned running as being, you know, something you discovered that you're talented in. I mean, your other big talent is uh, finding catfish on the internet. So, <laughs> so what, when you're in a, in a typical, I guess, year, as you've been filming the show for, for many years, you know, how, how many days a year does it take to film a season? How long are you on the road? Like, what does that structure look yeah. like? Um, so we're, it's, we have a sort of unusual production schedule because, uh, unlike most shows that say, okay, we're going to be filming from this day to this day, and we're going to do all 12 or 20 episodes. Um, we, we schedule our episodes as the stories develop. Right. So we're constant. We have like a rolling, uh, you know, um, group of a casting department that's constantly sorting through emails. I get, I get them every day. Uh, and they'll reach out, they'll connect, they'll, they'll talk to these people. Obviously they'll vet the stories and then they'll have to figure out when those people are free. Can they get off from work? You know, will their parents let them do it? There's so many factors, moving pieces, um, and so we never know what's gonna happen. So right now, like I know I'm filming an episode, uh, next week okay. on like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that could change, or they might say, Oh, never mind. The person decided they don't want to do it, but hopefully it won't. And then maybe another episode in June from like the 14th to the something, but like I, it's all tentative. So I'm always just sort of on standby because they're trying to schedule and there's a lot of moving pieces and, and we never know when and if it's going to happen. So we kind of just film all year because um, we're always just trying to get the best story and, and get out there and, and film it while it's happening. And, and the nature of the, sh- of these shows is that, or these people and their stories is that like one of them has obviously come to a point in the relationship where they've decided I don't want to wait around mm-hmm. anymore. Or I, I think they're lying to me or I've had enough. Um, and so they'll write in. And then I think their fuse is kind of short. Cause they're like, okay, I, I, I made this decision. I want to do this. Um, so I think it's generally like within a few weeks of, of their sort of first making contact and then us, you know, working to put it together and then all the schedules lining up. And again, like I said, a lot of stories as I've told, come, you know, get, get to that sort of home stretch and then they fall apart because of any number right. of reasons. Right. So right. like w- when you decide that you're, you're going to do a shoot, how do you kind of set the stage or at least like stay in sync with, cause obviously you, you decide that you're going to shoot and then life happens and like the, the stories progress while you're not shooting. So what do you, like, how yeah, do you right. stay? Is it like date? very kind of almost like improv on the spot uh, on like wherever that story you're picking up on that story, wherever it is, and like just kind of going, taking it, running with it. <laughs> like how much of it is pre pre planned? Right. Well, I mean, so my involvement up until we start filming is nothing because I don't want to right, know. True, true anything about the people where we're going. So I get when, when, when the episode starts and the camera starts rolling, like you see me finding out everything totally. Okay. So that's all, that's not scripted Um, or anything that are like, okay. They're all genuine. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No, Cammy, Cammy and I both don't know anything. Um, and we don't ever shoot anything over. So, okay. Yep. We're just saying what we're saying. Um, What's, what's great though, and, and part of the sort of structure of, of how this, the producers set, set up the episode is what, what they'll do is, you know, a day or two before uh, we start filming, they'll have the person who's reached out for help just sort of send a, an email, the email that we read on the show, so that they're sending like the most sort of up-to-date synopsis of the relationship. Yeah. 
Um, they, you know, they may have been in contact with our producers for a few weeks before, but like the idea is that we want them to feel as though they're genuinely telling us what's happening right now. And we want to get it from them sort of again in real time. So we'll read the email, we'll call them. We will, you know, we're, what you see us doing and asking is like all just curiosity and, and genuine questions. Um, and then we fly wherever we fly. We don't know anything. I mean, it's, that's, that's, so, that's, that's what cool. makes the show so fun. Uh, and it keeps it really interesting for us is that we're really on a path of discovery and, and curiosity and trying to figure it out. Yeah. So, um, that's been a big, that's, been, that's always been like a, a really important part of the show for me and Max and Cammy as the host to like really be doing it, not pretending and sort of, you know, per, like saying, Oh wow, we're going here. Cool. I had no, like, we don't know yeah, where we're going. Yeah. So it's fun. It makes do, it, it makes do it more guess ever. You know? It seems to me like if, as as a guest, if I think I'm if I think I'm getting catfished, right? Like I and I and I've watched the show. I used to watch it all the time. It's like I know how Neve figures out who a catfish is. Like you know, searching for someone on the internet. So are are any of the guests or, right. you know, the, are they, are they doing that own their own research ahead of time? So like they're coming into it almost like. I guess not acting, but like they're purposely not pursuing right. understanding if they are catfish or not. Cause they know they're coming on the show and they don't want to like spoil it for themselves or, or do, do they right. come on the show and they do actually know sometimes and they're, they're acting on their end. Yeah. Well, I think we've kind of had versions of both. I mean, I think there's a, there's generally, I mean, look, there's obviously a lot of people who have been in relationships where they did their research and found out they were getting catfish who don't come on the show. Right. Um, but I think, right. So the, but I think the people who, who end up on the show are people who either had some curiosity, did a little bit of research, either found nothing or hit sort of a wall. Cause a lot of the times you, you don't necessarily get any hits. Um, or what we hear a lot is started to, or, or thought about investigating, but felt weird about yeah. it. Thought that maybe it seemed a little creepy and that it would it would come across as distrustful if the person found out so there's like a weird and, and oftentimes that sort of manipulation comes from the catfish um if and when anyone ever says like why can't you video chat me or or why don't you just send me a picture with your you're holding this and and the person's like oh my god you don't trust me after everything I, i've told you so much about my life like how could you be so hurtful and then the person says oh i'm so sorry i didn't mean to hurt your feelings so there's, there's definitely a lot of like gaslighting and reverse psychology that um, catfish tend to use to keep people from asking True. questions and doing research. Um, but then there's also, you know, a, a willful ignorance. I think people don't want to give up a good thing. And if they have this person in their life that makes them feel good and keeps them distracted and happy, um, why fuck yeah. it up? Yeah. You know? Yep. Um, so... I think there's a lot of, a lot of that. Yeah, That's also. a great point. So in, in your original, you know, your catfish story that you made the documentary about when you were filming that, I'm curious, were you going into that thinking that that documentary would be like more of a love story or like, cause, cause you, you didn't know for sure. Right. So like <laughs> going into that, like yeah. having the mindset of, and I know your brother as well, you know, film, filmmaker, actor. So going in with the idea of we're going to capture this on film, did you know where it was going to go? Did you think that it was going to be a different story than it ultimately ended up being? Like, what was your mindset in filming? Oh that? my God. Um, well, just to be clear, my brother's not an actor. Not an actor. Okay. He's, he is in the documentary. Okay. Well, I, I know, He's I know he, had, like he directed uh parallel, uh, the most recent paranormal activities. Right. Uh, so Wikipedia has it wrong. Then I'm going to, I'm going to say that it's their fault. They, they I list know. actor. I, so, well, well, the problem, the problem with Wikipedia is that if you appear in a film, it just assumes you're uh, an actor. Yeah. Cause like, it's a, cause like just because he was in the documentary doesn't anyway, they can't I see think that I'm an actor too. I see what you true. mean. Anyway. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, so, so first of all, I never really wanted or, or considered that this sort of funny, weird side project that my brother was kind of making about me and my relationship would ever amount to anything. Um, and if, if there was anything we kind of all joked, it might turn out to be, it was going to be like a, like a funny short film we would show at my wedding with the girl who I had been falling in love with. Right. It was like, Oh, this will be a cute, funny video we can show at your wedding, you know? Um, 
And that was kind of the attitude we had all the way up until uh, basically the, the week we started really filming, which was when we discovered they had, they had lied to me about something else that we, that, you know, that sort of snowballed into, Oh my God, they lied about all these things. And what else are they lying about? So it really was not, I mean, it was very much like a weird side project that my brother and, and his friend Henry were, were not giving much attention to. And then all of a sudden they, I think realized like, Oh, this could, this could be interesting. Let's, let's actually spend a week filming this and, and see where it goes. Um, and then obviously it did get interesting and weird. I still didn't necessarily think it was going to amount to anything. Um, but they really dug their, you know, dug into it and spent a, a year kind of figuring it out and editing it and submitting it to Sundance. And I didn't even know what Sundance was, honestly. I, 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 if you'd asked me, I would have probably told you I thought it was a dance festival. Um, and, but sure enough, we got into Sundance and then we went and it was like this hit film at Sundance and then it sold, which meant it was going to move into, it was going to be in movie theater. And I was like, this is crazy. Who's, who's going to see this? You know what I mean? Like, um, and I was honestly, I was at that, even at that time, even, even when I knew it was coming out, um, I didn't really think I was going to pursue or have any success as a, in a career in like entertainment. Um, so I had actually gone out to California to interview with a, an old, my old boss from BMW motorcycle, uh, who was now run, who was then running a, a, a dealership out in, uh, um, Riverside, California, which is, it's a big so, so, sort of suburb of LA, but it's like far and kind of in the middle of nowhere and there's not a lot going on anyway. And I drove out there to meet with him to see if he would give me a job. Okay. And he, he, I remember he looked at me and he, he said, Neve, aren't you in this like documentary coming out? In a few <laughs> he's months? like, why the fuck are you trying and to I get a like, job? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. He's like, what? You don't want to, I mean, he's like, I'm not letting you move to Riverside to work here. Like the, the, figure something <laughs> else out, you know? Um, anyway, and I'm glad I, I didn't take that job, but, it wasn't offered anyway. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I really, I really did not, I never anticipated at any stage of the sort of rise of the catfish, uh, experience that it would continue to grow. And then I would continue to be a part of it. And now here I am 10 years later, I've still got this show. Um, there's a musical in the works oh, that we're, we're excited that's cool. about. That's, that's I mean, amazing. You know, that's still, that's still a ways off, but we're, we're, we're hopeful. Um, and yeah, I'm like, I'm the catfish guy. People roll down their windows and like yell catfish at me on the streets all around the world. It's like, so, so, wild. so at what point, like along the journey, are you like, well, I guess I am the catfish guy or is that just something that you continuously <laughs> like you exist in? And you're like, Oh shit. Yeah, like, I guess I, I kind of, do this for a living yeah you're okay are you okay just saying like yeah i'm the catfish guy even <laughs> though you do other stuff too just like i'm the catfish guy <laughs> yeah, totally <laughs> i mean i if, if if i could if i could be the catfish guy the rest of my life like that would be great <laughs> yeah. um and and obviously for for not just because i i love my job and it's a great job um but also because i am genuinely proud of the yeah. show i think it is a quality program that helps both the people on the show and also people watching and in some small way, you know, pushes the needle towards compassion and um, acceptance and self-expression. And I feel like we we're doing something good there. It's hard Um, to do in the reality TV show. People seem to agree. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. When you first then found out or got the offer to make the TV show, was that intended to be like a, a, just a pilot and then go from there or like, how has it progressed over the years? Has it been like renewed for, you know, a year at a time, multiple seasons and like, where, how is it going forward? How many, how long are you contracted for it? So, so yeah. So, I mean, uh, initially the, idea to make the show just kind of organically came because people started sending me stories and emails, um, after the movie came out asking for advice or telling me about something that happened to them. And it became very clear very quickly that there were a lot of other people in the same situation I had been who don't have the means or resources to, you know, get on a plane and go find out. Uh, and so we just looked at each other and thought like, maybe we can help them. And, maybe we can make a show out of it. Um, and so when, M, you know, we had, I think I, I, again, I wasn't that involved in the sort of business side of it, but, um, 
I think we had an offer from two different networks to do a pilot. Uh, MTV apparently was the one that w- wanted to give us the most kind of creative control over it. Um, and so we made the pilot and it, at, honestly, at first it was not very good. Um, the, the sort of vision that, uh, the showrunner and the production company had had was, was a little wonky. Um, and it took, took a few months in, in sort of the edit to figure out what, what the sort of right format was, um, and how to break up the, the journey and, and each segment and where it should yeah. start and end. I yeah. mean, it was, you know, it was, we, we had to figure it out. Um, cause unlike the show, the movie, the doc, like, you know, we, we, it was two days two, or whatever. It was a different process anyway. Um, but we did, we figured it out. Uh, MTV ordered a, a season one. The show was a hit. Um, I remember being just like so blown away that we got picked up for a season two. Um, and, and then of course, obviously it was, it, I think it was like the second or third week of the first season was when that whole Manti Teo controversy yeah, yeah. came out. So like, here we are, we've got this like, you know, cute little new show on MTV that sure is doing well, but like no one's heard about. And then the head coach for Notre Dame gets on the television and says verbatim, Manti Teo was catfished which comes from the TV show Catfish, which is on MTV. And like, he could not have yeah. so it, given us a better where, you know I mean? where were you when you first like heard or saw about that? Like, Do you remember getting a text so message? I was, yeah, no, I, I remember. So Max and I were in London because the, the show was premiering for the UK MTV, mm. and they brought us out there. And we were at, a, I think we were at dinner or something because it was evening. Mm. And my phone started ringing with numbers I didn't know, like, you know, and, and I answered one and it was like a reporter from CNN or some like me. I was like, what? Like, and, and so we obviously had to scramble and like the next day, I guess, or maybe that night we, we like live streamed with Anderson Cooper. It was just like, wild. it was so weird, um, but it was awesome. And then, and then similarly, not that long after that, I remember, I was in Los Angeles and I I started getting text messages. It was Saturday night. I started getting text messages from my New York friends saying, Oh my God, Adam Levine is hosting us now. And they just did a catfish spoof. And I was like, (sighs) what? You know, like, cause they don't, they didn't, I mean, you know, they don't tell you they're going to spoof you. They just do it. (laughs) So there was Adam Levine be playing me. Um, on SNL, which was wild. Anyway, so so the whole thing has just been like such a crazy trip. And and so for a long time, they would order one season at a time, which was like 20 episodes. And then I remember they ordered at like a season four or five, they ordered 40, which oh, was awesome. crazy. Um, and then I think they did that again. And then after season six, um, after Max left uh, to, to go on and continue mm-hmm. directing stuff, they they – their, their season seven order was a hundred episodes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so we're still technically going, finishing that order okay. of a hundred. Um, I think we have another 25 or something and then we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I'm again, I, I would do this forever. I, the best job in the world. So if they want to order another hundred, great. Um, but, We'll yeah, see. and then and Catfish the musical will be the next Hamilton, and you just <laughs> hitting love, on all cylinders. I think so. Maybe it might be. Honestly, we, it really we might be. Also, we, it could. We also do have a Catfish podcast uh, yep. for for people who like to like to get their content via audio. Um, check that out. It's, it's uh, you can get it anywhere, but it's a Wondery podcast, and um, it's pretty fun. Basically, we take episodes of the show. We chop them up a little bit and we use just the audio and then I kind of fill in and narrate throughout to kind of, to kind of help uh, um, paint paint the picture a little bit more and offer a little bit of kind of background. Yeah. It's fun. Yep. Yeah. I think uh, there's a couple of shows that have started doing podcasts about the show. And even though it's like pretty meta, but I, I find them fascinating just because you get a little insight into like what actually goes on. Well, what's cool about the Catfish podcast is that it's, it's essentially just like listening to an episode of the show. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting in, in our case because because the show is about relationships that aren't physical and, and don't involve seeing each other. People who listen to it say it's, it really helps them better understand the 
sort of emotional connection that the people have because they're not seeing who they are and what they look like either. And it kind of ah. just it lets your imagination kind of feel like similarly fill in the, the holes the way that I think these people do in their own relationships. Point. Yeah. It's a very yeah. good point. That is has, really has there been anything crazy on the show like that was that didn't make the show, but any thing behind the scenes uh, that you're that you're able to share? I don't know, like horror stories, physical, <laughs> anything like, yeah, physical fights, horror stories, a- anything crazy you can share? Right. I mean, obviously, y- you always hope that the craziest stuff gets. Of course, in, well, right? of course, that's, that's, that's how you, get, you, you, you <laughs> entertain right. the people. Yep. <laughs> right. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, we're not, you know, Max and I are, are, and Cammy too, we're, we're, you know, we're pretty mellow and, and not necessarily out of control people. Everything okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> My wife just walked in and uh, got the first aid kit out oh of the boy. bathroom. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, God. What happened? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, honestly, I, I wish I had some crazy great thing to tell you about, like something that got cut out. But when I think about all the craziest moments, I'm, it, I'm reminded that those actually are in the show. Those are the moments that, <laughs> Good are, point. Are, are, are in the show that are Good always point. that everyone's favorite. Moments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but if I think of something, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, we've only had one episode of all we've now filmed uh, over 200 and there's only been one that didn't air. Um, and and unfortunately, it it didn't air not be, it didn't air because something happened in it that you know made it unairable. It was a great episode. It was honestly one of my favorites. Um, so there was just some weird issue after we filmed with one of the people who was in the episode who got into some strange kind of like trouble, and so legally, you know, you, whatever. It was just like a, an annoying little legal issue. Um, but it was so sweet. It was this, it was this kid from Boston or outside Boston who was, um, developmentally, uh, challenged if that's, I'm not sure if that's the right, he had, he had a mental disability. Um, but he was really sweet and charming and funny and he was gay and loved meeting guys on the internet, which obviously that combination is, is potentially troubling and had previously met a guy online who had come to sort of meet and stay with him who turned out to be way older than he had said, but his family was so sweet and they ended up letting the guy stay there, but it was a disaster. Like very weird. Anyway, he met this guy. Turns out the guy was real. We went to Florida. They were like, they were so excited to be with each other. They went on their first date to Disney world. It was so cute. Um, and and then we couldn't air it anyway. Ah, okay. Interesting. So, Interesting. So that's it. That's, that's, that's the only big that's kind thing. Of a, that's, that's kind of a wholesome you one. Never heard yeah, of. Yeah, a little bit. Man. It yeah. was, it was. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious of all the things you've done in your career thus far. Like what's been the hardest. So like writing a book, the, the documentary, the TV show, training for a marathon, <laughs> um, dancing with the stars, like of those things, what's been the, the toughest Um, I probably training for a marathon. Uh, you don't have to say but, that just cause but, you're on a running podcast. I mean, you can say something <laughs> no, else. I, I mean, I, I, look, I, I've, I've been very lucky, um, that I've been able to apply my, you know, unique skill set and talents to things that I enjoy. Um, and, and to have incredible help and support along the way. So, yeah, I wrote a book, but like I had someone help me with that. And yeah, I make this show, but there's dozens of people who, who team, do yeah. most of the hard work. Um, and yeah, I was on Dancing with the Stars, but like my dance partner, you know, basically pulled me around the stage <laughs> for 12 weeks. Um, you know, but the like the running training for a marathon, like that's all you, you know what I mean? Like no, you can't phone that in. You, no one else can do it for you. Yes, my my coach Roberto it helped a lot, um, but like he can't make me run. True. You know, like I have to do it, um, and I and 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 it that was the least fun run of my life. That I remember hating almost every minute of that day, um, and it wasn't a good day. You know how sometimes you go out and you feel yeah, great, yeah, everything just flows. Yep. 
N- not that day. <laughs> I, I remember. I just I remember pretty early on, like mile seven or eight, just looking at me like, "Oh man, Roberto, like I'm not feeling great." Yeah. And but we had trained, and it was good. It was that was the day, so it was like, "Well, we're doing this." Um, and then I remember at mile halfway or fourth, I was just like really not. Fe- I was just not feeling it, you know. Um, but. I got, I did it, you know? And so like, even though I, I it was not fun and that's partly why I'm not necessarily motivated to try and do it again. Um, because it's, it's way more fun to run a marathon and like enjoy it. Um, it is, there is something, you know, just so satisfying. And, and I, I have to say my favorite sort of gift that my wife has ever gotten me was after the, the, the marathon. Um, she just got like a really simple gold chain with a little medallion that just says two fifty eight fifty four on it. Very cool. Um, and I love yeah. it. It's it. Yeah, means Man, a lot. so if it was that, if you didn't feel great on the day, then just imagine how fast you can go when you do have one of those flow state days. <laughs> well, you know, right, right. Cruising. And if, imagine if I like, yeah, if I really like really trained proper properly, <laughs> you know, like instead of just kind of like the bare minimum. Anyway. I think there's something there. We'll, right, well, look, I better we'll, get back. we'll fly out with you somewhere and train yeah, for yeah. Uh, a solid yep, training block. Yep. yep. <laughs> um, has anyone done a beer marathon? Oh, we've heard there's, of beer half beer, marathons. Beer half marathons is 13 beers, 13 miles, one every mile. But uh, I, I don't think we oh. can condone that in any public forum because that's <laughs> that's uh, that's probably what you would call a uh, you know binge drinking. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're going to stay away from that one. But <laughs> oh man! Wow. I mean, I guess you could. Yeah, you could. You could. You could shrink the serving sizes a bit, right? Fair. I mean, I think that's how you have to. Otherwise, I mean, you. Like mm. thirteen beers, yeah, I not great, know, man. <laughs> not great. well. It doesn't have to be every mile, right? It could be like every five k, or I don't know. Yeah, some, you could do some other interval, right? Absolutely, right, right. absolutely, right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm well, curious. Uh, so, if if you were giving advice to somebody who is like an a, aspiring creative, um, if you could call a younger you that, like, what what would you tell them? Sure, I, I think the best advice I've I've found when asked questions similar to that, uh, at least for, for just specifically for me. So I've discovered, uh, over, over the course of my life that I, I am creative. Um, and, and I'd like to be involved with and make things, but I am not generally the one who's like the motivating force. I'm not like, necessarily the team leader when it comes to getting through the like harder work nitty gritty of a project. Um, I'm great at having ideas. I'm great at connecting people. Uh, I'm great at motivating and showing up, but like because of my ADHD, like I, I can't sit down and like put together a spreadsheet or, or like a, like I'm just not good at that Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, or editing is just like, takes too long. It's too fresh. Like, so I found that the key to my success is to identify and engage with super talented people who are good at all those things. Try to be friends with them, try to be around them. Um, try to have something to offer them in terms of you know, whatever it can be. So for a long time, uh, though I was never a particularly great photographer, I was okay at it. I didn't want to like study and take classes and like learn how to actually, but I just I was like, I can do this. But because I had a nice camera and because I was passionate about it, I, I, I found people who needed photographs. So I ended up getting involved with like the dance community and all these young dancers who wanted pictures and videos of their performances. And I just sort of said, okay, cool. Let me do that for you. I'm not going to charge you. I just want to be here. Um, and that exposed me to an incredible world of talent and creativity that made, helped me make connections with people who then would jobs or, you know, introducing me to someone else that I, you know, like, so I guess networking with people, it has always been a big part of what I've used to succeed. Um, and figuring out what I can offer the people that I think have something to offer me. Yeah. Um, I think is a, is a valuable tool that I've employed over the course of my career. Um, 
because you can't really make anything totally on your own. I mean, obviously there are some exceptions, but at some point, if you want to achieve a certain level of success, like you need other people who are good at things that you're not good at. Yeah. Um, and so figuring out what those things are and who those people are and, and how you can get in with them and um, provide something to them is I think a really important part of, of being successful in any field, but certainly in the creative yeah. ones. I think that's great advice. Being around the people that are doing something that you want to be doing, you know, someone that you can look up to and, and work with, I think is is perfect. So I think that's a great place to, to, to yeah. leave the listeners. I do have two things to two listeners submitted, uh, I guess, statements that I just want to read, read to you. <laughs> sure. uh, so we do have a listener who said you caught um, their neighbor in the show in Wallingford, Pennsylvania, just outside Philly. Oh my God. I don't know. If, I mean, you've recorded so many episodes. You probably don't even remember this, but uh, apparently one of our listeners lived next door wow. to someone you caught that was a catfish. So <laughs> that's pretty, pretty Crazy. wild. That's yeah. Wild. And another one of our listeners just wanted to say that, uh, that your wife is a queen. She's amazing. So, you know, I, I don't know if this, uh, this person knows her personally or not, but just, just calling that out there. <laughs> it is amazing. If anyone wants to follow her, uh, animate. This has been awesome. Are we cutting out for you too? Yeah, wait, you're cutting out a little bit. Can you hear us? Oh, that was good. I don't know. It's doing some weird, uh, like be, clicky things. Well, yeah, if you're, when you're in Chicago, let us know. And, uh, ho yeah, hopefully we'll see you at the Chicago marathon at some point or somewhere, somewhere else, the next celebrity mile. We'll, we'll catch you at that <laughs> one. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Neve. Really appreciate Bye, it. Guys. Bye. Well, we had a little a little bit of a rough, who knows what was going on with the audio there that last minute or so. So you couldn't hear Neve formally say goodbye to you, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, I think we, we were looking, if you watch the video, you could see him mouthing some some words. I think he said something about, see you at the Chicago Marathon. Uh, love you guys. Like, thank you, Manscaped. Let's make what a else? TV show together. Let's make a TV um, show together. Something like that. You know, let me know if there's any ever anything I can do to, uh, you know, find out who some of your catfish are on your Instagram account. Like what, whatever it <laughs> is, should, he's wait, there You know for what us. he should do is he should he should go dox all of our patrons. He should. He should do the digging on them, pull up everything about them. I like it. Dude, well, that was, that was uh, as people from Boston would say, that was wicked fun, man. That was wicked fun. 